scripture, the writers aren't worried about being Calvinistic or Arminian. They're only interested in conveying to you what you need to know about your journey along the way. Now it seems a lot of times in the Bible in a single passage, or sometimes even in a single sentence, they pivot back and forth, but they're not pivoting. They're conveying the totality of what's going on. Now I'll explain it with a final analogy. Um, if we're talking, and I ask someone what makes a car move, an Armenian's going to say, put my foot on the gas, and it goes forward. That's pretty much it. Are they wrong? No, they're not wrong. It's how you make a car go forward. But upon hearing this, the erudite Calvinist would say, <laughs> it says, without an internal combustion engine, the car is dead and useless. So it's completely incapable of moving forward on its own. It says, the greatest efforts of pedal pushing would avail you nothing. But unseen to our eyes, when we push the pedal, gas and air is released into the cylinder. When the piston moves up and compresses the air, the air and gas is sparked by the spark plug and explodes and is forced back down forcibly. When the piston moves up again, the gas is released into the valve and the crankshaft is pushed down and the crankshaft power is transferred into the wheels, which makes the car go forward. Is that scientifically correct? Yes, that's what makes the car go forward. It doesn't negate the fact you still have to put your foot on the pedal if you want the car to go forward. Um, both explanations are correct. One tells us what's really going on beyond our sight things we're not really concerned about, things we don't know. The other deals with what we immediately have to do to get what we need. It's a practical application. So if you ask, is it important to understand the doctrines of grace if we are to grow? Absolutely. We need to understand that if we're going to grow in grace and as we begin to walk more with and more importantly like the Lord, we need to constantly remind ourselves that we don't deserve the credit, credit for any of it. Even our desire to follow Him is a gift from God. That said, to use our analogy, if one of my children has an accident and they're in mortal peril, they need to get to a hospital, I'm not going to ask a Calvinist for all the explanations of a combustion, internal combustion engine. I'm going to want our main and I'll jump in the car, put the pedal to metal, and get me where I need to go. So many people perishing without the Lord are in a much worse condition, much more dangerous state than anyone who can get fixed at a hospital. So I think what we really have here isn't so much a mix of monergistic and synergistic passages in the Bible. What we really have are theological and metaphysical explanations and practical applications. Remember the Shema. Or what Jesus says, the greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your mind. So the Calvinist got that covered. Your heart and your strength. Strength, our means got it covered. We're to be all three. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, heart, and strength. So I'm going to give you one last explanation from Scripture before we wrap it up. We have in Acts 2, we have the greatest evangelical sermon ever preached. It's at Pentecost. Uh, in it, we get the technique that was displayed by Peter, which is a model for us to duplicate. But we also get the spiritual explanation of what's going on from the author Luke. So, what we have in the beginning of the chapter, the Holy Spirit comes in, He enters the apostles. They are empowered with supernatural ability. They are speaking the gospel to people from all over the world in their own tongue. And all these people are getting saved. Peter steps up, he preaches his mini-sermon, and he quotes Joel 2.32. He says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pretty clear. This is an invitation to all. Um, our man's love is a parallel verse in the Gospel of John. Whosoever will. It's very popular with them. But it's right here. It's clear in Acts. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Clear promise. So Peter continues his appeal. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, 
Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So it's interesting. He's calling everyone and he kind of slips in like a little Calvinist verse, a little monogistic verse, that he's inviting everyone, but the caveat is everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who received his word were baptized. And they were at it that day about 3,000 souls. All right. So far, we have Peter preaching to the crowds, admonishing them to repent and be baptized. 3,000 people are making a conscious decision of their own volition to follow the Lord and getting baptized. Then, verse 47 explains who gets the credit for Peter and his fellow apostles' successful preaching. The Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. So I am a Calvinist. I believe in the absolute necessity of God choosing his elect before the foundation of the world. But I am not a hyper-Calvinist who needs to avoid a plethora of scriptures and common sense to cling to a paradigm. Salvation is of the Lord. There is nothing we can do or have done which makes us worthy. But this does not mean that God does not ordain things for us to do as part of his plan for our salvation. 